Hi, I'm Derek Ashong. Welcome to The Stream. We have a great show for you today. We're going to cover something that's quite controversial. It is the subject of the Ahmadiyya faith and whether or not it is accepted as a sect of Islam. We're going to have two people giving some really direct uh, and thorough ideas on what they believe there. Before we do so, I'm happy to have joining me Dahlia and Ahmed Dahlia. It's so good to see you. Uh, there have been a lot of feedback online about what's been going down in Oslo. Right. And we actually had some really interesting feedback on a post that one of our viewers submitted. Ahmed, can you take us through it? Yeah. Uh, Janne Andersen, who is from Scandinavia herself, she's from Denmark, sent us a storify about the Islamophobia of, you know, what's the reaction by the media to the story. A lot of people alleging it was a Muslim terrorist right away. And then the use of the word terrorist is appropriate, some people are saying, when, you know, discussing um, Islamic, you know, extremism, so to speak, um, but not Christianity or any other religion. We have on our Facebook wall, little Cool J Saddam Bashar <laughs> saying, uh, if the, this is That's his comment. Name. Yeah, we posted <laughs> yeah. that storify, and he said, if the person who killed 90 plus people in Norway was a Muslim, the press would have declared him as terrorist and the act as terrorism. For now, he's just an assailant, attacker, according to Reuters. BBC calls him a gunman, CNN, and even saying Al Jazeera. Mm -hmm. Looks like terrorist is a name reserved for Muslims. He then says the U.S. State Department calls it an act of violence, not an act of terrorism. So making the distinction because yeah. it's not Islam. So he's telling us to share the status. What do you think of this? It's a very interesting point, and I think he's true to a great extent. Uh, it, most of the people since the 9-11 attacks are just attaching terrorism to Islam, mm -hmm. and only Islam. But actually, terrorism has no religion. Yeah, I think that's a really great point. And it's funny, because when you see this written out so starkly, right. it just automatically rings true. I mean, I don't know if anyone could, we had the conversation about the blame the Muslims hashtag right. that was started by, uh, by Sunna, Sunim, Sunim right. uh, in London. Mm -hmm. But you know, when you read that, no one can dispute that if it was a Muslim who had did it, right. done it, it would automatically be described as terrorism. With, and when yep. you think Without about this idea of like Islamic terrorism, right. that's a relatively recent phenomenon. The word right. has been used for a long time, yeah. mm -hmm. but now all of a sudden it's got one definition. And mm -hmm. Without a Muslim having been involved, you know, even except in the fact that this, this, you know, this guy who did it, uh, Andrik Brevers, was apparently anti-Muslim, yeah. you know, at least in his beliefs, they were already using the terms massacre and terrorism. Many people in the mainstream media, as we yeah. talked about The Sun and others, um, so yeah, it's interesting. It's interesting how it's used. Yeah, well, I think, but part of the, the bigger question is what are the implications of that, right? I mean, when you're thinking about how a state thinks about security and how you deal with these issues, how you think about the dialogue around it, and there's one definition if it's a certain group, but the very same kind of actions are defined differently when it's another group or a right. person who's a member of another group, what does that mean for the way you actually respond to it? You know, there are a lot of Muslims all over the world trying to break this stereotype and to ch change the image. But actually, my organization is one of these, and we have been doing this for so long. But unfortunately, an attack like this can just disturb all that work all that work in, in a minute. Yeah. So I hope people in the future, when they come to defining terrorism, not necessarily attach it to Islam and only yeah. Islam. You well, know? you raise a really interesting point, though, because, yeah, an attack like this can really dissuade the work. It can uh, sideline it. But this was an attack there was no Muslim involved. And yet there has been so much dialogue about Islamic extremism or violence or action. I mean, they it's mind blowing. find someone with a beard yeah, murdered exactly. somewhere and they will say he's <laughs> exactly. the terrorist. And you've never heard anybody lazy. say, like, you got to look out for Scandinavians. Right. It's lazy. I mean, you know, it's interesting. You mentioned Egypt. Uh, I think the revolutions and the Arab awakening alone, because Egypt was a popular uprising, did a lot to dispel the kind of constructs that many people view Egypt or the Arab world in where it's terrorism or extremism or the Muslim Brotherhood. You know, Ahmad, one of my very favorite mentors, his name is Peter Ackerman, he, uh, in, a, in a recent speech he did at Fletcher School, he said something very interested, interesting. He said, Egyptians killed Osama bin Laden two months before he was actually killed, yeah. simply by making a revolution mm -hmm. showing the, board, uh, the whole world yeah. how nonviolent it was yeah, they we made him irrelevant. Exactly. Yes, the exactly. Whole so it's narrative. the whole Muslim exactly. world is not Osama bin Laden. We are different. It's such a great point. I mean, 10 years right. since 9/11 uh, and this uh, war on terror and this whole uh, Al Qaeda uh, dominance of the public discourse on Islam, frankly, mm -hmm. and they accomplished nothing. 
And then you look at what was done in Tahrir Square in a matter of weeks, although, I mean, it was a long time building, but in those weeks, they completely undermined that other ideology. Speaking mm -hmm. of Tahrir Square, you know, we have this article on our website talking about murder trials that are now being merged, where we saw Mubarak's murder trial has been postponed. Hopefully, yeah. we'll get to talk about it with you a little bit later in the show. Mm -hmm. So if you want to tweet in, you should tweet in and talk to us about it. <laughs> Absolutely. And speaking of that, so we're having a show today that is going to generate some dialogue. We know this because we've been getting tons of tweets for weeks before the show and lots of tweets right now. So if you want to join this conversation about Islamic identity, whether or not the Ahmadiyya are a sect of Islam and whether they should be respected as such, tweet us, AJ Stream, just like Ahmed said. Ahmed Dalia, great to have you. We're about to go live for broadcast. Thanks for joining us. We'll see you on air. Hi, I'm Derek Ashan. Welcome to the stream. We are an online community that sources stories from you, our people on the web. And these stories are typically global, and we always use social media as a way of communicating directly with you about what's on your mind. Today is a perfect example. This particular story is sourced from our community, and it's one that we've been tweeted, or at least has been tweeted at us for a long time. Believers are heretics. We're examining the plight of the Ahmadiyya community. Our digital producer, Ahmed Shahab el -Din, is here with us, looking out for your feedback, as always. Joining us today on the set is Egyptian activist, blogger, and poet Dalia Ziada. She is actually the regional director of the American Islamic Congress and was also named by Newsweek as one of the 150 most influential women in the world. Thank, Thank you, you, Dalia, for being Thank with us. It's a pleasure. Talk to us about what you're doing in D.C. right now. Uh, I'm doing some visits now. I've, I've been in the U.S. for over a month now. Um, I have recently graduated from Fletcher School with my M.A., finally. Congratulations. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> thank you. And uh, I came to D.C. to make some meetings for my organization and for my work and advocacy in Egypt uh, regarding the current situation and where we would like to go. Okay, and I know that you heard some things from people you met here in D.C. that are contrary to what you believe are the beliefs and interests of many of the activists back home in Egypt. Yes, many actually, and uh, I look forward to discussing it with you. Absolutely. So that's something we're going to be tackling in our post show. So remember to stay with us at stream.aljazeera.com. We're going to be discussing some of Dahlia's experience and what's happening in Egypt right after this. Uh, if you want to know what stories we're following, or actually we want to know what stories you're following, you can send them to us using the hashtag AJStream, and if you do so, you could wind up right here on the stream. On Monday, thousands of people in Bahrain took to the streets urging action against government officials who are accused by protesters of suppressing peaceful demonstrations. But on that very same day, the International Legal Panel, appointed by King Hamad bin Isa al Khalifa himself, began its inquiry into a crackdown on the recent protests that have killed more than 30 people in recent months. Now, since the emergency law ended on June 1st, tensions have remained high in Bahrain with daily protests. Uh, still being seen in Shia villages across the country. We've received several tweets, uh, including one uh, from Al Akir village, alleging that Bahraini security forces fired tear gas canisters inside homes where protesters were trapped because the exits were blocked. So, this Facebook page right here was sent to us from Sema Freedom, and I'm going to click through some of the photos. These images are basically detailing the march in Al Akir village where protesters claimed dozens of security vehicles were used to confront and disperse the crowds on Monday. Now, this page is being run by several members of the village, and it claims that women and children were among those injured while trying to flee from the tear gas, including a six-year-old child who was rushed to the hospital. Now, I'm just going to switch gears here to another tweet that came in from Ali Deeb, uh, chronicling the same thing. I'm going to play this video. This is the video which allegedly depicts what 
took place with the tear gas canister coming into the home. Now, I must mention that we have not been able to independently verify this video, but it does bring to light some of the larger issues in Bahrain. And we saw earlier this week reports on Twitter that Sheikh Khalifa bin Ahmed al Khalifa, the commander in chief of the Bahraini forces, asked Egypt to join the GCC after having already asked Jordan and, and uh, Morocco. So, what do you make of this? Uh, it, I feel it's a little bit funny. Uh, because I don't find it logic, Bahrain is still a monarchy, and we are, uh, we have just brought down a dictator just a few months ago, if he doesn't know. Uh, so it doesn't make sense that now, while we are, we want to build a new democracy, a new democratic economy to go and uh, put our hands with a monarchy that is now suppressing people inside Bahrain, as we can see in this video. So. Well, that's one vote against it. But uh, if you want to tweet us, you can always share stories like this one with us uh, using the hashtag AJStream. Derek? Now, we're focusing today on the Ahmadiyya community in this show. We're doing this because our online community, as I mentioned before, has relentlessly been tweeting us asking for a discussion on this subject. It's a very sensitive issue in the Islamic world, and we want to explore every angle. So, first, who are the Ahmadiyyas? They call themselves a sect of Islam, but critics dismiss them as heretics and non-believers. Why is that? The Ahmadiyyas are followers of Mirza Ghulam Ahmed, who was born in 1835 in the town of Qadian in India. His followers say that he was a prophet and a messiah sent by God to reform Islam, and that his advent had been foretold by the Prophet Muhammad. But those claims are considered blasphemous by mainstream Muslims who believe that Muhammad is God's final prophet and there will be none after him. Now let's take a look at a clip from, actually a, a short uh, picture. This is an image from a meeting that was held just on July 23rd by an Ahmadiyya organization. They claim to have tens of millions of followers around the world, and this is from a meeting that they had in the UK where 30,000 people were in attendance. Islamic scholars say a more realistic number of Ahmadiyyas around the world is 5 or 10 million, with the majority of them living in the Indian subcontinent. The way that these people have been treated in some Islamic countries has raised significant questions, however. What I'm going to show you here is an image from Indonesia. And as you'll see in this video, Ahmadiyyas have historically faced violence and different kinds of discrimination with their followers attacked. And basically, you'll find that their houses of worship have been burned in countries like Pakistan and Indonesia. Joining us now via Skype is Amjad Mahmoud Khan. He's the National Director of Public Affairs for the group Ahmadiyya Muslim Community USA. Also with us is Akbar Chaudhry. He's the founder of Muslim Identity, an organization that says it opposes attempts to dilute Islamic identity. Welcome both of you to the stream. Amjad, I want to begin with you. Are uh, Ahmadiyya's Muslim? Absolutely, we are Muslim. Uh, true and true. We profess to be Muslim. We recite the Kalma Shahada as all other Muslims do. We pray like all other Muslims do. We fast like all other Muslims do. We pay zakat like all other Muslims do. We make the pilgrimage to Mecca and perform Hajj like all other Muslims do. We profess to be Muslim. And yet, in spite of what we believe, we are persecuted in several Muslim countries, in particular Pakistan, and we are deemed to be non-Muslim by a constitutional amendment in Pakistan. So, Akbar, let me take it directly to you. Uh, do you believe that Ahmadiyyas are Muslims? Hi, Derek. Thank you for having me here. Um, Ahmadiyya faith has a new prophet. Once you have a new prophet, um, traditionally, you always branch off into a new religion. We've seen that with the uh, Mormons. I mean, Mormons also believe in uh, Jesus Christ. They also believe in um, uh, the Bible. But again, it, they have branched off because they had a new prophet on which uh, they, uh, it was binding on them to follow him. Same thing happened with uh, when Christianity branched out of Judaism. So it, it is very rarely seen in history that a prophet comes down to start a new sect or a new school of thought. A prophet usually uh, is associated with a new teaching, a new divine order, a new terminology, and a new the theology. But you use uh, the example of Mormonism. Many Mormons will argue that they are, in fact, Christians. We have got a U.S. candidate for the presidency, uh, Mitt Romney, right now, who will very clearly argue that he is a Christian. Exactly, and the, and the Ahmadiyya are welcome to say whatever they 
they they feel that they that they are. We have no issues with that. But when they claim to represent Muslims on the air or in the media, when they have no uh, uh, relationship whatsoever with the mainstream Islamic community, uh, they don't go to Muslim mosques, they don't pray behind Muslim uh, imams, they don't marry Muslim women, and they don't allow their women to marry Muslims. It is possible for a Christian man in Pakistan to marry, uh, sorry, a Muslim man in Pakistan to marry a Christian woman, but it is not allowed by the Ahmadiyya cult leaders uh, for an Ahmadi woman to marry a Muslim man. Now, would, an, would, Pakistan, an, would a Muslim man be allowed to marry an Ahmadiyya woman by the Muslim community in Pakistan? That's a very strong allegation you're making. So let's look at the yeah, other side. Yeah, so I mean, it is, it, is, it is not forbidden in Islam to marry a woman from the, the Christian faith or the, or the Judaic faith. But uh, Ahmadiyya have categorically uh, said that there is no inter, intermarriage between Muslims and Ahmadiyya, and they don't attend the funeral prayers. Now, in a society like Pakistan, which is very family oriented, uh, you are socially ostracizing yourself. You, are, you cut yourself off from society when you don't participate in these very important social events that make up the social fabric. So let me, there is let this, me, let there me is actually this. jump in right there because I know Dalia has got some thoughts. Uh, yeah, actually, you know, uh, I'm a Muslim, but I don't know much about uh, the Ahmadiyya community, except that, of course, I know how active they are in D.C. and, uh, like, lobbying very well. And uh, actually, I think they are doing a lot of... Uh, very good activities to promote a very positive image about Muslims all over the world, especially after, you know, the very bad reputations we gained in the West after all the attacks. So my question here to both of you, because I can hear so many contradictions, it's Ahmadiyya are Muslims or not? Just one answer, yes or not? Amjad? Um, so Amjad appears to be frozen. Uh, Akbar, would you like to say that? She wants a simple answer. Are they or are they not Muslim? No. Okay. Now, <laughs> no. and, and yeah. while I want to take a minute there, uh, and we wanted to get some of the tweets in, and we're just asking you to hold on for one second because we lost Amjad on Skype. We're going to get him right back. Ahmed, sure. this is something that has been so live online. Lots of comments. What are people saying? It's, you know, it's really true. Uh, Ahmad G is saying, by declaring Ahmadiyya non-Muslims, Pakistan has effectively disfranchised, uh, disenfranchised, I think, a whole community from the political process. Now, I hope you can still hear us because we have a tweet from Sabahat Ahmad saying, every Pakistani national must declare Ahmadis as non-Muslims to get a passport or an ID card. Mm -hmm. Now, so many people have been tweeting us this, but then we received this one tweet from Ahmad al Nimr who's saying, anecdotally, his Ahmadiyya's flatmate showed him the Pakistani passport application and that you must sign that you oppose the Ahmadiyya's faith to be granted one. So this is an interesting point because we learned that you actually have to have a, your religion stamped on the Pakistani passport. And, right. and I'm actually interested to get your thoughts, Dahlia, on this. You know, the question here, whose choice is it? Okay, whether the Ahmadis are Muslims right. or non-Muslims, or it is a completely different religion. Right. Why the law of the country should interfere in deciding this? I mean, Judgment Day is there yeah. for a reason. No, you're right. And you know, we, we don't have the right to judge others based on the religion, have these blasphemy laws, have people just telling you you are right or wrong just because you adopt a certain religion. Well, on that topic, it's interesting you say that because Ahsan Ahmed says, boiling it all down, I mean, regardless of who can say who is and who isn't yeah. a Muslim, he's saying the simple definition of a Muslim is whoever reads the kalima. Right, which is the kalima or the shahada, shahada we call it, which yeah. is la ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah. There's yeah. no God. Which is what Amjad was saying. Right, earlier. but yeah. Allah, and we're seeing a lot of Ahmadis, even if they might have believed there's a new prophet or a messiah, they're saying yeah. they actually say la ilaha illallah. So you know, Ahmad, I think you know this very well. Even in our region, in the Middle East, there is an intra-face problems, like yeah. between Sunnah and Shia, even. Yeah. You know, they they each side claim that the other is praying for God in a different way, so yeah. he is different, and they find ways to hate each other. But, for example, you find the same people tolerating, for example, someone coming uh, who is a Buddhist, someone who yeah. is uh, worshipping something else different. So how come you can tolerate the one who worships the same God as you, right. and you can accept working or dealing with uh, someone who doesn't believe in God? That, I think that's yeah. a very pr important question, especially in this case. You know, we uh, are hearing these arguments that actually Pakistan is taking very strong steps 
to outlaw certain aspects of right. the faith, and people are prevented from doing basic things. I think you know what you're talking about, and what we're all witnessing is that it's become institutionalized yeah, as exactly. part of the government, and that's what you're objecting yeah. to or questioning. As is Atif Ahmed saying, Ahmadis are booked under Article 298C for calling themselves Muslim which can lead to three years imprisonment and a fine. And I just want to highlight the part of the law that we found. So this is mm -hmm. a part of the Pakistani penal code. It says, any person of the Qadayani group or Lahori group who call themselves Ahmadis or by any other name, who by words either spoken or written or by visible representation refers to the mode of... Basically, it says at the end, I'm just going to get to it, says, shall be punished by imprisonment of either description for a term which may extend to three years and shall be liable to a fine. Okay, so then let's go back to our two guests. I think we've got our Skype fixed. And Am Amjad, let's come back to you on this. We've been talking about the civil rights concerns of the Ahmadiyya in countries like Pakistan where they're not afforded the same rights. Wouldn't it be simple to address this issue by declaring yourself a new faith? No. Um, before I got uh, knocked off air, I wanted to respond to the allegations that were raised by Mr. Chaudhry. Um, he's raised several allegations which are just spurious and part of a, a long line of attacks that he's leveled against the community. Mirza Ghulam Muhammad never claimed to bring a new law. He claimed to be a subordinate prophet, one who was Nabi al ummati one who was in the following of the Prophet Muhammad, and he claimed him to be an independent prophet. So this is not a new religion. This is fulfilling the promise that the Prophet predicted, which that a Messiah would be necessary and a Mahdi would be necessary to come. And Mirza Ghulam Ahmed claimed to be occupying those roles. Now, as far as Pakistan is concerned, anyone who professes to be a Muslim, that is, anyone who declares their Shahada, should be accepted as Muslim. No man or government should determine whether someone is a Muslim or is not. That reservation is left for God alone. Now, in this particular, these particular laws, over 1,000 individuals, which include Muslims and non-Muslims, have been prosecuted under these vague statutes, and the punishment attached to that is death. So if I'm an Ahmadi Muslim, and I profess to be an Ahmadi Muslim, and if I recite the Salama, or if I say Asalaamu Alaikum, or if I put an Arabic script on a wedding invitation card, or if I simply put Arabic script on a tombstone. These are arrestable offenses, and I can be charged and sentenced. So now, now uh, Amjad, I'm going to stop you there because I think we've lost Akbar. We're going to try to get him back on Skype, and we're going to come back and give him an opportunity to respond to that point. Dahlia, um, it seems there are very strong positions from the theological perspective. Why do you think this has come to be a matter that goes into the state, that comes to actually address the rights that people have before the law? I think it all has to go back to the dictatorships. These regimes that want to gain legitimacy, why by, you know, withdrawing this legitimacy from a certain group and introducing them to the people as a threat. Mm -hmm. This way they gain this legitimacy, like we are pro protecting you from this threat. Yes. But speaking from a civil rights perspective, and I've been a civil rights activist for a while, it's really important to understand that the law of the country is something completely different from how God judges us. Mm. It, we are not gods. Why should we play God in people's life? Why should why should tell people what they should believe in and why they sh should not believe? Let's them? bring this to Akbar. How would you respond? Yeah, uh, <laughs> it's it's a very strange thing that is uh, being said here. Any country that, that that is based on a religious foundation, as Pakistan was, has a right to legally. We are not what people feel inside themselves is not the business of the state. I mean, Israel was founded based on Jewish identity. It has a right to determine that the person who lands inside Israel and claims to be a Jewish citizen, uh, which they, they, they allow by law, they have the right to determine who is a Jewish citizen. If you were to go to Israel today and say, I'm a Jew, they would say, uh -uh, we're going to apply some tests and make sure that you are, you, you are a Jew. Same way Saudi, Ar Saudi Arabia is going to determine whether a person can enter Mecca or not because there are certain laws around that. Akbar, I'm sorry, I just need to interrupt you for a second. I have to ask you, uh, a lot of Muslims feel very strongly about those Israeli laws about how people are treated based upon their religion. Are you saying that from the Pakistani perspective, those laws that distinguish treatment based upon religion are justified? Uh, I, I, I would need to go into them one by one. The head of the FIA in Pakistan, Wasim Ahmad, is an Ahmadi. There are 
generals in the army. There are inspector generals of police who are uh, who are who are Ahmadis. They have passports. They travel all over the world. Uh, Pakistan, because the constitution of Pakistan does not allow a non-Muslim to uh, become the prime minister or the president of a country. Therefore, they have to put certain tests in place in order to satisfy that 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 condition. So. Uh, re regarding the blasphemy laws, I have some facts and figures here. Akbar, uh, before you go to, to the, before you go to the facts, go ahead. Uh, yeah. yeah, I think. Uh, I'm, I'm uh, done. One moment. We're, let's okay. get Dalia just, in. We'll uh, come right back just, to you. Just very quickly, uh, uh, I can see all the examples you've mentioned are for extreme countries. You know, regard and they have many political and uh, complicated issues that we cannot compare me. to the ideal civil. Uh, no. rights society yes. that respects individual rights that we all are looking forward to. Now yeah. let me let, let me let Amjad have an opportunity. No, no, Akbar, hold on one moment. I'm going to come back to you, Akbar, in just a second. Let's let Amjad get a response. Go ahead. Thank you. Appreciate that. Uh, there is no other Muslim country in the world that has a constitutional amendment that declares explicitly a community to be non-Muslim. There is no other Muslim country in the world that requires its passport applicant to declare and attest to their founder to be an imposter. There's no other Muslim country in the world that actually attaches capital punishment for a crime based on freedom of conscience. This is the state of affairs in Pakistan. To say that the Muslim world permits this is to misstate the record. That is simply not accurate. There have been hundreds of Ahmadis who've been prosecuted under these laws. Over 300 have been killed since 1974, since this amendment. 99 were killed last year. This is a tragedy. I advocate for the rights of these Ahmadis in court. I defend these Ahmadis and I hear their stories. For Mr. Soldier to sanitize this persecution, to say that these laws are justified, when it's very clear that the case of Asya Bibi, the assassination of Saman Tahir, of Shabbat Bati, that these laws are emboldening in those like the Sharik e Taliban Pakistan, who would kill the innocent and the vulnerable, is to really whitewash what is happening in Pakistan. Legally, it's untenable. There is no basis. It violates the, the most important covenant, international covenant, the ICCPR, to which Pakistan has signed. They are violating international law with these laws. And it's time, and I hope, that people like Upper, who render frivolous allegations against our community, regardless if you are a member of our community, Surely you can see the compassion here. Now, Amjad, I'm going to interrupt you there because speaking <laughs> of community, we're getting a lot of comments from our community. That's fine. Yeah, um, Akbar, I want to get, I want to put one question to you, but I understand you yourself were a uh, part of the Ahmadiyya, you know, you could say faith, and then now you're not, and you, you are part of a moderator of this site called khatam e nubuwat So I just want to read something that you have describing Ahmadism as a pseudo-religion whose leadership exploits its members socially, psychologically, and financially. Now that's quite a switch, and if you wouldn't mind answering this concern by Gillian C. York, she's saying, asking us if we're going to cover the ban on social media amongst the Ahmadiyya community. Yeah, I left the Ahmadiyya because I think, I, I think it to be a cult. I mean, I don't know what, what Amjad is doing on a social uh, media program here, because their founder has banned Facebook and everybody knows ab not. Ab ab about it, and it is right Absolutely on their not. It, it's right on their website. And then when these when these revolutions were happening in uh, in Tunisia and in Egypt, uh, they they were ag against the Arab Spring, and their Absolutely women wrong. Their, their their women are not allowed to vote or hold office in the general body of the Islamic community. Uh, Absolutely that's wrong. Okay, we're running really getting low on time, Akbar. I'm sorry. So Amjad, how that's do you respond to those them, allegations? That is why we call them a cult. Each and every, each and every one of those allegations is so patently frivolous. It's so absolutely true. It uh, is the right website on the that Upward Rotary is, is promoting is completely <laughs> wrong. Our women can vote. Of course they can vote. They hold office in our community. The idea that somehow we are a community that's a cult, we are established in a hundred and ninety-five... Amjad, are Amidia allowed to use Facebook? Absolutely. There is no ban on... Oh, my God. This is... Everybody on Twitter is tweeting. Everybody on Twitter is tweeting that they are not allowed to use Facebook. It's no. right on their website. If I may just, if I may just qualify this, the claim came on one of your websites, Akbar. So it's just a claim, and it, you know a lot of people on the Ahmadiyya community are saying that there are just cautions against the, the you know the problems in Facebook. I, I, I can send you the URL with the with the actual link in there. 
Ahmadiyya community. There's an official Twitter page of the Ahmadiyya community. Ahmadi Muslims are allowed to use Twitter and LinkedIn. There was a policy put in place to guard against the risk of individual Facebook use because there were individual members who were being targeted. There's defamatory language against them in the interest of protecting their hijab and their privacy and their security. The head of the Ahmadiyya community discouraged the use of individual Facebook to say that there is an outright ban on social media is really to distort the record. Amjad, Amjad, I'm going to interrupt you there because we're going to continue this conversation in the post show. Dali, I know you have some questions. There's some very interesting things going on. I know for a fact that Ahmadiyya and non Ahmadiyya are on Twitter because they've been tweeting us like crazy and they're continuing to send in comments. If you want to join this conversation, come with us to our post show, stream.aljazeera.com. Some of these issues we've talked about today, including the claims of intolerance and violence against the Ahmadiyya in Pakistan, are going to be covered as part of Al Jazeera's Activate series later this year we're going to keep you updated uh, stay with us tweet us at AJ stream to join this conversation remember uh, stream .com. we will see you online Hi, welcome back. We are talking about the Ahmadiyya Islamic community, whether or not they are Muslims or heretics. We've got two very opinionated guests uh, joining us. This is really something that has garnered a lot of attention online, particularly amongst our yeah. community. But just before we go back to them, Dahlia, what's your take on what you hear so far? Yeah, I'm also noticing on my own Twitter account, people are commenting in various directions. Everyone is just saying different opinions. but. Let's all agree on one thing, that if you are really a true Muslim, you should respect everyone. You mm -hmm. should respect the freedom to select. Also, I've seen in the uh, recent conversation uh, now between our two respectable guests, um, they are, I mean, getting into issues related to business, like LinkedIn and social media yeah. and politics, and putting them all into the box of religion. Mm. Religion is something different that should be both beside these things, not both these things inside it. Do, yeah, do you get what I mean? Absolutely. So let's look at religion as a separate thing. It's not politics. It's not business. It's your relationship with God. Yeah, I want to uh, get ask one question because we're speaking of politics. Uh, Amjad, some people have been alleging that the Ahmadiyya have basically been sellouts to the Islamic community, have been appearing in... Uh, news media in Western countries and speaking about themselves, uh, for example, like Fox News, speaking about themselves as the peaceful sect of Islam and other Muslims as not being uh, aspiring to those same basic principles of peace. How would you respond? Well, I think that's a fundamental misunderstanding of what the community is doing. The community is, has been systematically re rebutting the false allegations against Islam and protecting the beautiful face of the Prophet Muhammad. To say that we're somehow maligning other Muslims no community member has maligned any other Muslim community. Many Muslim groups, in fact, have lauded the efforts that we're doing, particularly here in the United States. We have a Muslims for Peace campaign, a Muslims for Loyalty campaign. We've launched a Muslims for Life campaign where we're going to be raising 10,000 bags of blood on 9-11. We are going door to door and distributing flyers to represent the true teachings of Islam. We are not maligning any other Muslims. Uh, Akbar, so yeah. uh, Amjad so, is doing good works. Aren't you <laughs> no, proud? No, Wouldn't you support no. this? I mean, either my, my uh, friend who is a Harvard lawyer does not understand the English language and how it is used, because when one Pakistani yeah. guy, Faisal Shahzad, put a bomb in Times Square, which did not go off, Ahmadiyya went in Times Square reminding everybody, we are the good Muslims. Now, in Norway, a Norwegian has killed other Norwegians. Should every Norwegian go about saying, I'm a loyal Norwegian on my head? So what you're doing is you're implying by your, by your uh, words that these uh, Muslims are generally not loyal. Every Muslim group in the UK, and I've been on BBC and I've been on Channel 4, every Muslim group in the UK is so mad and confused at these kind of campaigns that alienate and label the general Muslim com com community, what right does the Ahmadiyya have to, uh, to, to, to do such campaigns when they are not coordinated with the, the Muslim le leadership of those uh, countries? Akbar, let me give Amjad an opportunity to respond to that. Amjad, a lot of people are upset. Are you saying that yeah. they are all, their concerns are baseless? 
No, I'm saying that this is a distorted record, and it, it's quite <laughs> startling, actually. Uh, the Faso Shazad the attempted bombing was not a trivial matter. I live in the United States. Uh, Akbar may live in, you know, across the pond. He doesn't realize the extent of that attack, or the Virginia Five, or the Muslim youth who have divided loyalties. There is a serious threat from extremists who would pervert Islam to nefarious ends, and we as a community says enough is enough. We need to rescue our faith from the clutches of militants. Because the founder of our community well, did so. Hasim, and we are Hasim, not maligning Marge. other Muslims. If you just allow me to finish and explain, there Hasim, are some Muslim Marge, leaders. Went on and said that Muslim 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 my turn. But yeah. uh, just, just to address your concern, Derek, there are some Muslim leaders who misunderstood the Muslims for Loyalty campaign and suggest we're somehow saying that Muslims should give a loyalty oath. We have never suggested any such thing. He I have reached out to the Muslim Public Affairs Council, Muslim advocates. They are aware of our campaigns. We've had an honest and intelligent dialogue about our campaigns, but we've never in any way maligned the Muslim community. And mind you, these are some Muslims who actually don't even treat us as Muslims. And yet Akbar would say that we are not bringing the entire Muslim community to our campaign. We've repeatedly asked them to join our efforts. This is not a, a sectarian issue. This is an issue where all Muslims can rally around. Let's get some additional voices. Let's get some additional voices into this. Okay. Akbar, I'm sorry. I'm hold on one moment. I'm, I'm Akbar, very Akbar, hold on one moment for a second. We're going to come right back to you. Akbar. Yeah, I'll put this to you, Akbar, but I just wanted to end the social media debate. So please don't, you know, continue it. But I want to say Ihsan Ahmed tweeted us saying, social media hasn't been banned in Ahmadiyya, only cautioned. Uh, has been advised due to privacy fears, which many have. Wait, please don't, uh, Akbar, just one second. Uh, and then she asks a question. So this is to you. Why is it that Khatmi Nabuat, which is your website, calls for a boycott of mobile service providers and Ahmadi businesses? I guess the question is, what are, what are you so afraid of? No, no, this is, I mean, this is not on my website or any other website. I have a mobile phone and everybody has that. The question is, we have retweeted the link to their official website that contains a link on how to delete your Facebook account, okay? And it says no individual Facebook accounts allowed. It's all over the, the, the Twitter feed uh, 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 there. I do not represent any association or any organization in Pakistan or in Indonesia or anywhere else. All I'm saying is that here are the, the, the reasons why the laws are there in Pakistan, because when you use the reserved words of the Muslim community, and Dalia was saying that um, uh, no civilized country has such laws. The UK has laws. The United Kingdom has laws that a Catholic cannot ascend to the to the throne. And members of that the doesn't Royal make Catholic, it okay. Yeah, and exactly. It, why, why, should the the why should we follow them? No, why should we follow them? Why I, shouldn't we set an example as true Muslims that we respect yeah, others? Yeah. And, and these, these these are news where the Ahmadiyya have claimed that there were leaflets distributed in in the UK uh, uh, calling to kill them, and there were no such leaflets. There, there was no police complaint and nothing at all. And Mr. Amjad can stand there and say that they are not maligning the Muslim community. I mean, this is pre. I have no problem with Mr. Oh, Amjad yeah. representing his own community anywhere. I love him. My mom, my sister, my bro brothers are still Ahmadi. I have no issues with them. But when they go out there and try to malign the Muslim community and speak on behalf of the, uh, the Muslims, then it really does cause a huge problem. I, I challenge, I challenge you, Mr. Strawberry, to show one pamphlet, one speech, any any physical evidence to show yeah. that we're maligning the Muslim community. Nassim 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 went Nassim online. Let's let, Dalia, let's let Dalia get a thought in. I'm sorry, Akbar and Amjad, hold on one moment. Dalia, please. Let, let me ask you a question. Ahmadi is a minority in Pakistan, right? So they are yeah. preaching hatred against me, the whole society? If they no. did this, they will be eaten by the society. It's no, no, not exactly. going to be. Exactly. We are talking about UK and US here. We're talking about UK So this proves that they can't even do. They can't even think about it. Yeah, right? and, 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 uh, and Akbar, we've got to get this question in, into you that's come back from Twitter about something we raised earlier. Many people yeah. are asking us to clarify this, suggesting that you've been avoiding it. Uh, Samia is saying, avoiding question about whether the Muslim world would allow an Ahmadi man to marry a Muslim woman. And then another tweet from Ahmadiyya Post saying, please ca clarify if a Pakistani Muslim man can marry an Ahmadi woman. Mm -hmm. I mean, any Muslim man can marry a monotheist woman, a, a woman who is not a, a mushrika, who is not a polytheist or an idol worshiper according to the Quran, and that includes Ahmadis, and that includes 
uh, Jews and that includes Christians. Okay, so, uh, this so, is my understanding of uh, of uh, so you're uh, saying yes. having a, uh, a Muslim but woman. We've, but we've also understood. That, let me just press on this issue. We've also understood that the Ahmadis are not allowed, for, for example, to perform the Hajj. So you're saying that it would be okay in the Islamic community to marry a woman who would not be allowed to uh, perform the Hajj. No, no. I, I, anybody who is not a polytheist, according to the Quranic definition, is uh, you are a, a Muslim is allowed to marry them. This is very clearly there in the in in, in the Quran. As I said, there are Ahmadi generals in the Pakistani army. Mm -hmm. The head of the FIA, it is like the FBI in Pakistan. Masim Ahmad. Is, uh, was just retired. Was a so uh, to that Very point, bad. Amjad, yeah. Akbar is saying yeah, that... The only thing, uh, the only thing uh, that I'm is sorry, so pardon me, Akbar, one more moment. Amjad, Akbar is saying that that uh, Ahmadis are living and participating at the highest levels of Pakistani society. So what is your concern? Let, let me explain something. We cannot vote in Pakistan. We are denied. We're the no, only no. community that's denied the right to vote. That is a fact. No, it is a not fact. a fact because yes, you have a separate electorate. You have a separate electorate. electorate. My turn. In order to Executive Order 15, if you Google it, you will see this, passed by Musharraf on June 17, 2002, says that the joint electorate, which was reinstated in February, does not apply to Amadis until and unless they declare that our founder, the person whom we believe is the Messiah and the Mahdi, is an imposter. So to say that we can freely vote in Pakistan is completely based. So they, there is a separate electorate for all Minor, are minorities. Amjad, please, Amjad, let's let yeah. Akbar respond. Go ahead. There, 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 there is a separate electorate for minorities, Christians, uh, Hindus, and Ahmadis. If Ahmadis don't want to be part of the separate electorate, there's reserved seats for them in parliament. If they don't want to participate why, in why that, is that there is a separate electorate, Akbar. Because why they is have there a separate declared, electorate? They, they, they have been declared. Not, they, Amjad, they hold on, please. They a minority. They have been declared a minority by the constitution. And why is that? Because of this. Because they want to use reserved words for Muslims. For example, in Islam, Ummul Mu'mineen is used for the wife of the Holy Prophet. Ahmadis say Ummul Mu'mineen is the wife of Mr. Ghulam Ahmad. In Islam, Sahaba means uh, the companion of the Holy Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Ahmadiyya yeah. say Sahaba is the companion of Mr. Yeah. Ghulam very, Ahmad. Very they funny. have been declared a minority. They Sorry, Eric, could I, if you guys stop, could like, stop just yelling for one second, I have to put this question to you because someone is accusing us of being unbelievably biased, saying we haven't let one of their tweets in. So one of their tweets is, how many times must he say that Ahmadiyyas declare all Muslims non-Muslim? Is that true, Amjad? Yeah. Absolutely not. Absolutely not. The Amity community does not declare all Muslims to be non-Muslims. This is fabricated evidence. Again, this is yet a spurious allegation. The Amity Muslim community, let me make it very clear. Anyone who professes to say the Kalma Shahada, who identifies themselves as a Muslim... Uh, Amjad, no we understand. Thank you both of you so much for joining us. Amjad, I appreciate it. Akbar, I appreciate it too. A spiritual you. discussion. Dahlia, you get the last word. What are your thoughts? Uh, again, I will go back to the point that civil uh, or, or the civil rights that are guaranteed by some government's constitution should not tell people what to do or what not to do, especially when it comes to their relationship with God. Wonderfully said. Thank you so much for being Thank with you. us. Really appreciate you, Thanks. Ahmed. Great show. Thank you for joining us. Remember, tweet us at AJStream. We'll continue to see you online.